northern Texas. It's, you know, a dramatic occasion in retrospect, because here were two of the great political titans of the 20th century. Roosevelt got back to Washington. He said, just met the most extraordinary young fella in Texas. If I had grown up in the South, he said, that's the kind of politician I would have been. He said, well, let me tell you, this is a young fella. In future generations, someone like him is going to be president of the United States. Johnson and Roosevelt established a great rapport over the years. And Johnson never forgot the political lessons he learned as a child sitting with his father in the Texas State Legislature. He felt that his job as a congressman was to help people, to reach out and do all he could for them. Now, I don't want to carry this too far and idealize this man to the extent that one would say, oh, he was a selfless altruist. Of course he wasn't. He was tremendously self-serving. He was intensely ambitious, but he was never happier than when he could marry his ambition to some larger constructive project and do things for people. That's the way he operated. Do things for people, and it will be doing something for yourself as well. Being a congressman was not enough for the tall Texan. Johnson was ambitious. He wanted to be a senator, and in 1941, he decided to make his run. His opponent was one of the most popular governors in Texas history. Pass the biscuits, Pappy O'Daniel. Nobody thought Johnson had a chance. But he ran his usual tireless campaign, stumping the state from early morning to late at night. And he thought he had won the election by some 5,000 votes. But at the last minute, his corrupt opponents were stuffing ballot boxes in isolated districts. When the final count came in, Johnson had lost the election. Roosevelt said to him later, Lyndon, you should have sat on the ballot boxes. Well, they didn't, and uh, a lot of ballot box stuffing went on, and uh, Johnson was asked, well, <clears throat> are you going to challenge him? Are you going to bring this in the courts? And he, no, he said, no, I'll get the SOB the next time around. Though distressed over his defeat, Johnson, at 33, knew he would make another run for the Senate. He vowed never to be cheated again. But his political frustrations were put aside in December 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Johnson was one of the first congressmen to join the Navy. On a fact-finding mission in the South Pacific, his plane came under heavy fire, and Johnson was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry, the only one on his flight to get a medal. Since then, the award of Johnson's Silver Star has been surrounded with controversy. After the war, Johnson was concerned with his financial future. Having grown up poor, he was always worried about money. He was not sure he would continue to be successful in the risky business of politics. So he and Lady Bird invested in a radio station to start their broadcasting business. Eventually, they added a television station and bought real estate in Austin. Now, with financial security, they could start a family. A daughter, Linda Bird, was born in 1944, and their second daughter, Lucy Baines, in 1947. By 1948, when Johnson was 40, a Texas Senate seat was again up for grabs. He believed it was his moment. But in the Democratic primary, Johnson had to first battle Coke Stevenson, a very popular governor. And the election this time is once again, uh, very, very close, impossible to call. And of course, there are all sorts of allegations, and I'm convinced from my research that they're accurate, that uh, at the last minute, uh, Johnson's friends in uh, the Rio Grande Valley uh, stuffed the ballot box, and uh, Johnson won the primary election against Coke Stevenson by 87 votes. And uh, forever thereafter, uh, Johnson was nicknamed Landslide Linden as a, a way to belittle or make fun of this uh, a stolen election, as people uh, described it. Stolen or not, with the Democratic nomination firmly in hand, Lyndon Johnson easily won the general election. He took his seat for Texas in the United States Senate, where he would hone his legislative skills and make an indelible mark on American politics. As Johnson's success grew in the Senate, so would his ambition to rise to the highest political office in the country, the presidency. In 1948, after 10 years in the House of Representatives, Lyndon Johnson was finally a senator. He quickly climbed the ranks of the Democratic leadership. In 1955, at age 44, Johnson became the youngest Senate Majority Leader in history. 
Johnson, being the kind of political innovator he was, turned that office into something it had never been before. And he made himself an exceptionally powerful majority leader. As Senate Majority Leader, Johnson became, in some ways, President Eisenhower's man in the Senate. But Eisenhower could also be said to have been Johnson's man in the White House. Together, they made things work in an era of mostly bipartisan politics. Johnson ran the Senate with an iron fist in a velvet glove. I don't think anybody's ever topped him at trying to be persuasive. He would grab you by the lapel <laughs> and uh, just uh, really say, you know, we want to get this done. And he put his arms around his shoulder, take him back to the office, and he'd give him what Evans and Novak have called the treatment. He would push them to do what he wanted them to do, appeal to their patriotism. He understood. He was a master psychologist. When he was at the height of his power in 1955, at age 46, Johnson suffered a major heart attack that few thought he would survive. He continued working from his hospital bed and never let the public know the seriousness of his illness. But Lady Bird knew, and she was always there for him. Lady Bird came to my room, and I decided I'd better do a little detective work. And I said, honey, I don't think there's much use. The doctors don't think I've got one chance out of ten to live, do they? And she said, oh, yes, they do. They think it's 50 50. <laughs> she was such a serene presence in this volatile man. All she needed to do at times was to put her hand on his knee and he could relax. You could almost see this kind of negative energy drain away from him. Lady Bird had become indispensable to Johnson. Though he reportedly had many affairs, their marriage grew stronger every year. After his heart attack, he worked harder than ever. And I hope I'll come back uh, refreshed and rejuvenated. This is a man who used to say, half-jokingly, I never think about politics more than 18 hours a day. And he was someone who could work 18 hours a day and would insist that everybody around him work 18 hours a day as well. In 1956, Johnson flirted with running for the presidency, but it was nothing more than a gleam in his eye. Then, in 1960, trying to position himself for a presidential run, Johnson thought he could campaign from the Senate where people could see his effectiveness as majority leader. But he lost out to the highly effective campaign run by Senator John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts. Kennedy entered and won primaries across America, assuring him the Democratic nomination. Johnson quickly realized Senator Kennedy had outsmarted him. He was always pretty bitter about that. Uh, he kept talking about the fact that Kennedy was so young, so inexperienced, uh, so unaccomplished. Uh, he said he needs a little gray in his hair. You know, he's wet behind the ears. He would derisively describe him as a kid. Kennedy understood that Lyndon Johnson could help deliver him the Southern vote. So he offered Johnson the vice presidency, and after some hesitation, Johnson accepted. Johnson was mostly a ceremonial vice president. He traveled abroad, had a role in the Space Administration, and was active in civil rights, but he did little else. Though always on the go, he managed to make time for his family. The time Linda uh, made top grades at the University of Texas, he happened to be flying to California for a speech, and he came back through Texas and uh, to see her and congratulate her with a big box of clothes. And I remember him just looking at her and saying, I love you so much. Johnson's strong family ties helped him through his days of unhappiness in his greatly reduced role as vice president. Those around him thought it was the most miserable time in his political life. But he soldiered on, doing whatever President Kennedy wanted. Then, on November 22, 1963, Johnson's role suddenly changed when John F. Kennedy was assassinated by a sniper in Dallas. Everyone was in a state of shock, Johnson included. He was chagrined by it. He saw it as a horrible thing. Uh, he was greatly pained by it. On the advice of Attorney General Robert Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as the 36th President of the United States inside Air Force One before it took off for Washington. I thought, what a good 
um, man to have it in an emergency uh, because uh, we never missed a beat between presidencies. And then um, I handed Bill Moyers uh, a something I drafted, the 58 words that LBJ used when he stepped off the plane in Andrews Air Force Base. This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. Johnson had become an accidental president, something he never dreamed would happen. But he would rise to the occasion. He vowed in the first days after the death of John F. Kennedy to bind the nation's wounds. In the years to come, he and the nation would bask in the glow of domestic triumph and know the sorrow of foreign tragedy. Thirty days and a few hours ago, John Fitzgerald Kennedy died a martyr's death. On November 22, 1963, with the death of John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson had become president. Understanding the need for continuity, he appealed to everyone in Kennedy's administration and the Congress to work with him on the orderly transition of power. Johnson's first priority was one of John F. Kennedy's fondest dreams, the war on poverty, which would become one of the cornerstones of his administration and the fulfillment of his life's work. This administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. He was willing to gamble and experiment uh, on social programs to see if he couldn't elevate people out of poverty, get them above that poverty line. 1964 was an election year. Johnson easily won the Democratic nomination and defeated Republican Barry Goldwater in a landslide victory. The Democrats also won a majority in both houses of Congress. No longer an unelected, accidental president, and with a Congress that would do his bidding, Johnson felt he could move out of Kennedy's shadow. His most far-reaching social experiment was the Great Society, Johnson's vision of a more perfect America, with federal government involved in every part of every person's life. For in your time, we have the opportunity to move not only towards the rich society and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. Lyndon Johnson was a revolutionary. He was interested in a major revolution in American society. Uh, we went after it in terms of civil rights and blacks and giving them equal opportunity. Johnson had always been a hands-on politician, trusting no one but himself. As president, he allowed nothing to escape his attention. Johnson would often start his day on the phone, selling his programs, making believers of unbelievers. And then he'd start calling the senators and congressmen at 6 in the morning. If the senator wasn't there, he'd talk to the wife. If the wife wasn't there, he'd talk to the daughter. Now you tell your daddy to go with me on this bill. He just loved it. He loved the process itself. Johnson worked everyone around him as hard as he worked himself. Working in the White House was like living on the edge of a runway. I mean, it was, uh, it was tumultuous. I wake up in the morning and read my papers and uh, read the documents that were left over from the night before that I need to pass upon have my briefings and uh, my breakfast and come to the office between 9 and 10 o'clock. Aides and assistants were in and out of the Johnson master bedroom discussing strategy and getting orders. Occasionally with Miss Johnson there, once or twice, I, I came over to the bedroom and she was asleep, you know, trying to, trying to get a little rest while he was up there just working and talking and carrying on with people coming in and out of the, the bedroom. And then I work at a rather feverish rate until 1.30 or 2, and I have a swim and take out 15, 20 minutes. Then I go and have a lunch, or usually a business lunch, working lunch. And about 3 o'clock, I take a little nap for 20 or 30 minutes, and that breaks the day for me. And then I'm good till 8 or 9 that night. I don't recall ever having sat down to a dinner table with my mother and my father and just eating a, a meal with my family until I was 16 years old and my father and all of us had been catapulted into the White House. Trying to capture Lyndon Johnson just to sit down and eat with his family was kind of like trying to hold a moonbeam in your hand. It was, it, was, it was elusive. So our family moments were few. And family moments were often too brief. There was much work to do as president. 
And like many presidents, Johnson pushed the envelope on his health and had his share of physical ailments. In 1965, he had his gallbladder removed, and his actions during his recovery caused quite a stir. He didn't want to keep a secret about all of it. You remember he lifted up his shirt and showed his scar. A lot of people were, uh, were shocked at that. It was just Johnson being inclusive. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he just wasn't holding anything back. It was all part of being Lyndon Johnson, an earthy Texan who wanted to change America without holding any of his ideas back. President Johnson's most productive year would be 1965, the year of the famous 89th Congress. It was a time of reform, and Americans were given Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid to education, environmental and consumer protection laws, and major civil rights guarantees. The hundreds of bills he passed, the most important was the Voting Rights Act, because it would bring black America into the political system. By far, Johnson's most challenging problem was the war in Vietnam. When he inherited the presidency, there were already almost 18,000 Americans in South Vietnam. On the advice of his civilian aides and the generals, Johnson kept sending in more troops. With every move he made, the United States was pulled more deeply into the war. The massive buildup continued unabated, and by 1966, there were more than 550,000 American troops fighting the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. The war consumed Johnson. He was obsessed by it. He was possessed by it. He was ruined by it. Vietnam became uh, his uh, waking nightmare. And he couldn't let go of it. And he couldn't concede that this had been a mistake. He more and more felt that he personally was at stake, that he would be the first American president that ever lost a war. He became more and more paranoid, basically. In a sense, what he does is he creates a situation in which the United States is fighting not America's war, but Lyndon Johnson's war. By mid-1967, the United States controlled the conduct and philosophy of the war. In terms of strategy, in 1941, he decided to make his run. His opponent was one of the most popular governors in Texas history. Pass the biscuits, Pappy O'Daniel. Nobody thought Johnson had a chance. But he ran his usual tireless campaign, stumping the state from early morning to late at night. And he thought he had won the election by some 5,000 votes. But at the last minute, his corrupt opponents were stuffing ballot boxes in isolated districts. When the final count came in, Johnson had lost the election. Roosevelt said to him later, Lyndon, you should have sat on the ballot boxes. Well, they didn't, and uh, a lot of ballot box stuffing went on. And uh, Johnson was asked, well, <clears throat> are you going to challenge him? Are you going to bring this in the courts? And he, no, he said, no, I'll get the SOB the next time around. Though distressed over his defeat, Johnson, at 33, knew he would make another run for the Senate. He vowed never to be cheated again. But his political frustrations were put aside in December 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Johnson was one of the first congressmen to join the Navy. On a fact-finding mission in the South Pacific, his plane came under heavy fire to reach out and do all he could for them. Now, I don't want to carry this too far and idealize this man to the extent that one would say, oh, he was a selfless altruist. Of course he wasn't. He was tremendously self-serving. He was intensely ambitious. But he was never happier than when he could marry his ambition to some larger constructive project and do things for people. That's the way he operated. Do things for people, and it will be doing something for yourself as well. Being a congressman was not enough for the tall Texan. Johnson was ambitious. He wanted to be a senator. And in 1940, northern Texas... It's, you know, a dramatic occasion in retrospect, because here were two of the great political titans of the 20th century. Roosevelt got back to Washington. He said, just met the most extraordinary young fella in Texas. If I had grown up in the South, he said, that's the kind of politician I would have been. He said, but let me tell you, this is a young fella. In future generations, someone like him is going to be president of the United States. Johnson and Roosevelt established a great rapport over the years. And Johnson never forgot the political lessons he learned as a child sitting with his father in the Texas state legislature. He felt that his job as a congressman was to help people. 
and Johnson was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry, the only one on his flight to get a medal. Since then, the award of Johnson's Silver Star has been surrounded with controversy. After the war, Johnson was concerned with his financial future. Having grown up poor, he was always worried about money. He was not sure he would continue to be successful in the risky business of politics. So he and Lady Bird invested in a radio station to start their broadcasting business. Eventually, they added a television station and bought real estate in Austin. Now, with financial security, they could start a family. A daughter, Linda.